Uh, just in case you're not aware, today, uh, March 19th, is the Solemnity of St. Joseph, um, the husband of Mary. And so, of course, this past week we had St. Patrick's on Thursday, St. Joseph's today. So two of the patron saints for our uh, two of our churches here at uh, part of St. Isidore's. Um, now, I have to say I'm a little bit uh, upset, if that's the correct word, that nobody noticed my joke in the bulletin this past week. So if you haven't noticed, the quote that's on the inside of the bulletin is always from one of the saints of that week. And so because we had Patrick and Joseph, I included quotes from both of them. But the joke is, St. Joseph never said anything. So it's just an empty quote. So nobody picked up on that, and I'm kind of upset. But, you know, we'll let it go. Um, Speaking of uh, feast days, uh, this coming Friday, March 25th, is the solemnity of uh, the Annunciation. Uh, It is not a holy day of obligation, although it should be. But you might know that on that day, Pope Francis is uh, going to um, consecrate Ukraine and and Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And he has asked all of the bishops around the world to do so with him. And so to do that, or part of that, uh, Bishop Hine will be celebrating a special mass at 11 o'clock, 11 a.m., not p.m., on Friday at Immaculate Heart of Mary in Monona. So I know it's not exactly down the street, but if you're uh, available, he will be celebrating a special Mass on Friday. Now, as far as news for us, you should have received a flock note this week about our online giving option. We are excited to announce that the parish now offers a quick, easy, and automated way for you to offer your gifts and tithe. There's no more need to remember your checkbook or cash each week. Simply go to our website on any device to get started. You can make one-time donations or even set up a convenient recurring gift that can be managed from your own donor account. It's easy, quick, and convenient. And I hope that this will be a way for us to continue to support our parish going forward. So our readings today call us to focus on who God really is. And it starts by thinking about what he calls himself. Because in the Old Testament, a name told the essence of that person. So our reading from the book of Exodus is the famous story of Moses and the burning bush. God calls Moses and gives him the commission to go and set the Israelites free from their captivity in Egypt. Moses then asks his name so that he can relay it to the Israelites. And God says, I am who am. The implication of this name is that first, God is a mystery. This name is difficult for us to understand completely. Second, God is. He always has been. He always will be. God is eternal with no beginning or end. In philosophical terms, God is being in itself. Third, God places himself in distinction with other false gods. He is, they are not. From this name, we get three of the fundamental aspects of who God is. He is eternal. He is beyond all other created beings. And he is a mystery. But there's much more about God. With questions like these, I love to turn to the Baltimore Catechism. Some of you may remember that. I love the Baltimore Catechism because it's simple yet always true. It all comes down to God is infinitely perfect. The Baltimore Catechism sums it up as God is eternal, all good, all knowing, all present, and almighty. God has perfect intelligence as opposed to our imperfect intelligence. God can do anything logical, whereas we are limited in our strength and abilities. God is perfectly good, while our goodness is limited. Now, atheists try to defeat God by attacking these attributes of God, but using logic always proves the existence of God. For instance... Attempting to attack the truth that God is all-powerful, they ask, 
Can God create a stone that cannot be lifted? If yes, he is not all-powerful, since he cannot lift it. If no, he is not all-powerful either. The problem in this question is a bad definition of omnipotence. It does not actually mean the ability to do anything. It means the ability to do anything that is logical. Or as C.S. Lewis said, his omnipotence means power to do all that is intrinsically possible, not to do the intrinsically impossible. Or to paraphrase St. Thomas Aquinas, a contradiction implies impossibility. God creating a stone that he cannot lift is a contradiction, and therefore impossible, and therefore illogical. Similarly, God cannot make a married bachelor or a square circle because they are logically impossible. This is not a limit on God's omnipotence, but instead a logical absurdity. Another area where atheists try to defeat God is the problem of evil. And admittedly, this is a difficult question to face because it seems illogical. If God is all good, why is there evil in the world? Well, the answer is that God is so good that he allows us to choose to do evil. He has given us free will. He loves us so much that he allows us to choose for ourselves. And this all comes down to the beginning of creation in the fall, first of the devil and then of Adam and Eve. God created angels and humans with free will, the ability to choose good, in other words, to follow him, or to choose evil, to disobey him. First, the devil decided that he didn't want to follow God. His pride led him to choose to disobey God and begin the fall. And the devil, as we hear in Genesis, then led Adam and Eve to choose to disobey God, at which point sin entered the equation. It all comes down to choice and the reality that God knew that creating a world with free will was better than a world without it. And so he gave us the ability to choose good or evil. God never created evil. He never wills evil but he allows it to happen. It is always good to remember the words of Job. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We accept good things from God. Should we not accept evil? Remember also that he did not leave us in an infinite spiral into evil. As St. Augustine said, God always creates good out of evil, even the greatest evil. God allowed the devil and later Adam and Eve to fall, but he corrected it by sending his own son to defeat sin and death. This is something that we should always recognize. Where there is evil, always look for the good coming from it. War is evil, but God counteracts with good. Look right now at how the Polish people, for instance, are helping the Ukrainian refugees. They are being God's agents of good against the evil of war. And this leads us to the gospel. Jesus speaks about two incidences of evil that occurred in that time to help the people understand. First, Apparently, Pilate killed some Galileans who had gone to Jerusalem to offer their temple sacrifice. Also, 18 Jewish people were killed when a tower fell in Siloam, near near the pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. Was God to be blamed for these tragedies? Certainly not. On the other hand, were the victims to be blamed as the ancient peoples believed? They felt that a tragedy such as these indicated that the people killed were sinners and deserved an untimely death. Jesus says that this line of thinking is wrong as well. He very very clearly says that those who had died were not greater sinners than anyone else, by no means. So what is Christ trying to teach them and us as well? These stories are meant to be a wake-up call. 
Waste no time. Repent now, because you never know when you may die. Now, I remember when I was younger, I used to think, well, it's okay if I sin now, I'll just go to confession later. Or, I don't need to practice any charity now, I can do that later. I don't need to give to the church now, I'll do that when I'm older and have more money. In many ways, I was fortunate. I wasn't thinking clearly at the time that tomorrow is never guaranteed. And the good news, Christ does not leave the warning there. He adds this parable of the fig tree. For three years, the tree gives no fruit. When the master says to cut it down, the gardener instead argues to keep it another year. Again, what is he saying with this parable? It's a way of saying to us that God waits for us to repent. He wants us to repent. He will give us one last chance, but time is running out. Do not wait too long. Do not refuse the offer of repentance, or else we condemn ourselves. In the end, we are reminded that God is loving He is merciful. He is patient. He's also just, and he never denies us our free will. God allows us to sin. He will make good out of our evil, but he also needs us to repent. He is giving us a wake-up call. As St. Paul says to the Corinthians in our reading today, whoever thinks he is standing secure should take care not to fall. We need to be on our guard against sin. And when we do sin, we need to repent. We need to remain right with God at all times, because we never know when we may be called. So I invite all of you to come to confession. Do not put it off another year, another month, another week. Humbly come to God, asking for forgiveness. Receive his mercy and his love in the sacrament of penance. It is a most beautiful gift that he has given us. It is a necessary step towards salvation. Come on Tuesday in Argyle between 315 and 345, or Thursday here from 6 to 7, or Friday morning in Hollandale after Mass, or Saturday here between 315 and 345. And if none of these times work for you, ask me at another, an, another time that is good for you. Take advantage of God's medicine for the soul. And remember the words from Ash Wednesday. Repent and believe in the gospel.